the second Sunday after Epiphany. Again, we'll be back here in Quebec. In the epistle for this second Sunday, is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12. Brethren, we have gifts differing according to the grace that has been given us, such as prophecy to be used according to the proportion of faith, or ministry and ministry, or he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhorting, he who gives in simplicity, he who presides with carefulness, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without pretense, hate what is evil, hold to what is good. Love one another with fraternal charity, anticipating one another with honor. Be not slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. Be patient in tribulation, persevering in prayer. Share the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Be of one mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but condescend to the lowly. In the Gospel, taken that according to St. John, chapter 2. At the time a marriage took place at Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now Jesus too was invited to the marriage, and also his disciples. The wine having run short, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, What wouldst thou have me do, woman? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the attendants, Do whatever he tells you. Now six stone water pots, water jars, were placed there after the Jewish manner of purification, each holding two or three measures. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them to the brim. And Jesus said to them, Draw out now and take to the chief steward. And they took it to him. Now when the chief steward had tasted the water after it had become wine, not knowing whence it was, though the attendants who had drawn the water knew, the chief steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man at first sets forth the good wine, and when they have drunk freely, <coughs> thou hast kept the good wine until now. This first of his signs, Jesus worked at Canaan of Galilee, and he manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. <coughs> The first of the miracles of our Lord performed before, before his apostles today. And that the disciples are there, the Blessed Virgin Mary is there, our Lord Jesus Christ is there, there is a marriage feast. And there are many of those that do not believe in Christ and do not even know that Christ is there. Remember this very first miracle of our Lord Jesus Christ. These people at the marriage feast, they did not know that Christ was a great prophet. Remember later on, after he had performed many miracles, they waited to receive him in all the cities. They waited, they, they, went, they went out to, and, their, and his shadow would cause miracles. And he raised the dead. Remember that our St. John says that if all, all the miracles that Christ performed, if they were written down, it would fill up more than all the books in the world. So there's something very special, even in a practical way, about this first miracle of our Lord. And one of the, one of the aspects of it is that only the disciples knew the miracle. The disciples knew the miracle. So there are many miracles that Christ performs. There are some miracles which only the disciples see. And there are other miracles which all see. And these miracles happen all the time in the history of the church. For instance, the great miracles that the disciples see, these are the miracles that the priests of the church and the followers of Christ, those that are living, the, the, not only the priests of the church, but the followers of Christ, those that are living the faith, should see regularly. They should see miracles. See the miraculous working of Christ. There are many, many times in which we should have died, but it didn't happen. Many times in which we put, put, put in circumstances in which we would have lost our faith, but it didn't happen. There are many times in which we, if we open our eyes, we will see the mother of Jesus was there. And if we open our eyes, we will see that water pots and water were somehow turned into wine. Now, what does the, what does the devil do in order to destroy the Catholic Church? He has to destroy the disciple. 
In order to destroy the Catholic soul, he's got to destroy the disciple. Remember in olden times, in order to become an apprentice in any business, no matter what it was, if you wanted to become a carpenter, you lived with a master carpenter. If you wanted to become a silversmith, you lived with a master silversmith. You ate and slept and worked and recreated and did all things with the master silversmith or the master carpenter and you followed him in every part of his life in order to learn how to drive nails into a piece of wood, in order to how to shape a chalice and so on. So that it would, to be a disciple means to be with the master when others are not. Not only with the master in the places where everyone is with him. When we come to the church, everyone is with the master. Not only as friends, but also as enemies. Everyone comes to church. Everyone is in the chapel. Everyone is at the mass. Everyone is at the essential places where they have to be. But the disciple is with Christ in the night. And the disciple is with Christ as he's walking from one place to another. And the disciple's schedule is determined by the master. When does he go to bed? When does he get up in the morning? Where does he go? What does he do? Now a disciple who is with Christ should see miracles that those that are not disciples do not see. A disciple that is with Christ should feel the presence of the Blessed Virgin Mary that those that are not with Christ do not feel. Now remember at this marriage feast, there are many people there. Everyone is there. And there is a miracle taking place in their <coughs> presence, but no one knows about it except the disciples. And not only this, but notice the conclusion of the miracle. The bridegroom, he's the one that set up the celebration. The bridegroom was the one who didn't make enough wine, who didn't have enough prepared. Part of the reason, say, some of the fathers of the church is because of the fact that the disciples came. Because our Lord Jesus Christ brought with him his disciples. He brought with him fishermen and they drank too much wine, and therefore there wasn't enough. But, there, but even, if it wasn't with, even if it was just a few extra fishermen there drinking extra wine, there should have been enough. Because everyone knows at a wedding feast, many, many people come. And more people come than what is invited in an eight-day feast, so you have to have enough wine. And there was, in fact, negligence on the part of the bridegroom. He didn't have enough wine. And therefore, what happened? Now, Christ performs a miracle. The bridegroom does not know about it. In fact, when, when at the end of the gospel today, the, the, the chief steward, the Archicotrinus, he brings over the bridegroom and says, Thou hast saved the good wine until now. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I put out the good wine at the beginning. You see, I noticed the wine's better now. I told him to put out the good stuff at the beginning, but, but I guess the servants weren't paying attention. I did the normal thing. But thou hast saved the good wine until now. He did not know about the miracle. But he was praised for it. He did not know that the water had been turned into wine, but the servants knew. And so it is, if we are followers of Christ, if we have the Catholic faith, if we follow Christ not only at the Mass, but we follow Him in our homes. As it says in Psalm 90, in Gubilibus Vestrius Compungimini, in your bedrooms, in your cubicles, in your bedrooms, with compunction of heart, think of the things of God. God is with us at all times. But though He's with us at all times, and He's performing miracles at all times, we do not see them. We do not understand them. He is always making extra wine, because we never have enough. He is always protecting us. He is always taking care of us. He is always providing for us. This is the mystery of divine providence. See, we see in the Gospel today and one example of divine providence and it happens in a marriage feast when we enter into the sacred sacrament of marriage one of the acts of faith that a young couple has to make when they get married God will provide and one of the grave mistakes of our times is that man who gets married thinks he has to support his family a, man, a woman that gets married thinks she has to have all the quality time with her kids and so on. She has to have enough strength to be able to have this kid. She has to have enough quality time with this kid before she can have the next kid. Therefore, she's got to space her children. And she has to do this and she has to do that. And he has to do this and he has to do that. And they both have to make sure they got enough money for a college education. 
And these are sins against the first commandment. They're sins against the first commandment. Not only sins against the sixth commandment. They're not just sins against purity, and they're not just sins of murder, like abortion and the various forms of birth control. They're not just sins against the fifth and sixth commandment. They are more serious sins. They're sins against the first commandment. Because God will make sure if a few extra fishermen show up at the feast, there'll be extra wine. And we see this multiple times in the gospel. He feeds the 4,000. He feeds the 5,000. He taught us a prayer called the Our Father. Give us this day our daily bread. He knows that the daily bread will be given. But he doesn't say our weekly bread, our monthly bread, our bread for a year. Bread for a day. He gives us our daily bread. And that when we enter into a following Christ, we travel light. And why do we travel light? One reason is that's an easier way to travel than carrying a big weight upon your back. But another is, on a long journey with Christ, don't be over-prepared. Don't have a backup plan. Follow Christ. And he will make sure that there's food around the corner. He'll make sure there's water coming out of rocks. He'll make sure that there is bread. He will make sure that we are taken care of. He will make sure if some extra people show up, there will be enough food. He will multiply it. He will provide. And these miracles Christ performs time and time again. If you look in your Catholic marriage, you got married and you couldn't afford a kid. Now you can't afford number 17. You can't afford number 18. You can't afford number 19. You can't afford the house. You can't afford the car. You can't afford anything. But God performs miracles every day if we have the faith. And even if we don't, He performs the miracles anyway, but we don't open our eyes and we don't see them. The miracle happened in the very midst of all these people at the marriage feast, but they were busy getting drunk. They did not notice it was better wine to get drunk on than what they had the other day. They were still getting drunk. They were still celebrating. They were still in a party mode. And they didn't see the miraculous working of Christ. Now the devil is trying to destroy the Catholic Church. And he's trying to destroy the Catholic family. And he's trying to destroy the Catholic father and the Catholic mother and the Catholic priest. And the Catholic brother and the Catholic sister and the Catholic child. He's trying to destroy all things Catholic. How do we be Catholic? By being disciples of Christ. Following Him in the night. Following Him outside the church. Following Him in all the places in which we find ourselves. Everywhere. And learning somehow His ways. Learning somehow how He walks, how He talks. Now remember the two disciples on the way to Emmaus. They knew that Christ was dead. They knew that Christ was defeated. They knew that there was no hope. And they were completely confident that they would never see Christ again. But what happened? They recognized him in the breaking of the bread. Because they had been so close to Christ during those three and a half years, they noticed his mannerisms. They noticed the way that Christ walked, the way that he moved his hands, that no one could imitate. There was a way in which he took the bread and pulled it apart that was so unique that no one could fake it. And though they didn't believe, and though they were filled with discouragement, because they had been so close to Christ during those three and a half years, when they saw Him break the bread, they said, that's Him. And they recognized Him in the breaking of the bread. They should have recognized His teaching, but they didn't recognize that. They talked to Him all day. They should have recognized His face. They didn't recognize it. They recognized Him in the breaking of the bread. And so likewise, Christ will make sure that we recognize Him in little ways. But this can only be done if we have the habit of being with Him in Cubilibus Vestris Compungimini, in the bedrooms, consider the things of God. And how does the devil destroy this disciple? He makes him forget. As it says in the Gospel today, the chief steward did not know from whence the water pots came, but the disciples knew. And we are in a time today in which people do not know from which bread comes. They don't know when, where the heat comes that keeps them from freezing to death in Quebec. They don't know from what, where, where, the, where the clothing comes from. 
They don't know where anything comes from because they're ignoramuses. But the disciple knows. The disciple knows. Who, get, who makes eyes able to miraculously see? God does. And that is why when Padre Pio, we mentioned many times, one of his miracles, a girl who was born with only white blobs where her eyes were supposed to be. Born only with white blobs, two round white blobs, no pupil, no iris. Goes to Padre Pio and he cures her so that she can see. But he didn't bother giving her a pupil. He didn't bother giving her an iris. Just let her see. And she sees through a white blob, but she doesn't have an eye. Because how does the eye see? By the power of God. And God decided that she could see through little white blobs, and so she sees through white blobs. God is the one who makes it able for us to see. God is the one who makes it possible for us to hear. God is the one that makes it possible for a woman to have a child. God is the one that gives us a house. He is the one that gives us all the things that we have. And if we open our eyes and see, there, He is the one who makes sure that we have a car and we have the things we need. When they break down, sometimes it's the best thing. Your brake car breaks down and you find out the bridge was out. And you were going to drive off of it. So many times, open the eyes and see how the Blessed Virgin Mary and our Lord Jesus Christ are always in the Catholic family and always in the souls that are trying to follow Him, even if they fall many, many times and make many, many sinful mistakes and they try to return to God. What happens? The grace of God still works inside of the soul and He wants the soul to see His workings. And the majority of souls today forget. One of the supernatural causes of the crisis in the society of St. Pius X is the sin of pride. The sin by which the disciple forgets from whence the wine came. He doesn't just forget. It isn't like, what store did I buy this from? Did I get it from Walmart? Did I get it from Kmart? That's one kind of forgetting. That isn't the kind of forgetting. Who made this wine? Did God take water and turn it into wine miraculously? Well, actually, I, I'm, a, I'm a winemaker. And, you know, I, really, I've got a special gift for turning water into wine. You know. you know, I did this before. I can do it again. And so what happened is the disciple somehow forgets. The disciple somehow believes he's the one that carried the water pot. He is the one that poured the water into the pot. You know, where were you? You were getting drunk. You were partying. I was pouring the water into that pot. I was carrying that water pot. I brought the water pot here, and that's why it turned into wine. And it's really good wine, too. If you were carrying it, it would be bad wine, or it would have turned into grape juice. But I carried it, and it's good wine. Why? Because I carried it. Somehow they forget, but it's not just forgetting. It's replacing that God did not make the water into wine. The Blessed Virgin Mary did not tell him to turn the water into wine. We forget about her. We forget about Christ. And somehow the water turned into wine. And this happens to the priest. He forgets. Who is the one that makes the miracle of absolution happen inside the confessional? Who is the one that takes away the sin and makes a soul filled with grace? Who is the one that brings the grace of God to souls? It is God Himself. It is Christ. It is the Holy Mother of the Church. It is the Blessed Virgin Mary. This is how it happens. But we forget. And we think somehow, oh, we did it. We forget, we forget, we forget. And so what happened? The SSPX began to believe the SSPX is great. Hmm. And the SSPX is the last bastion of the Catholic faith. And without the SSPX, the Catholic faith much collapsed. We started in 1970. Jesus Christ lived some time before that. And also there were guys like Saint um, Dominic. There was a Saint uh, Francis. There was a guy named Benny. There were all these different saints, but they died. We somehow get in our heads that before the SSPX, there was no possibility of salvation. There was no Catholic Church. There was no hope for the world. 
And this is foolishness. God used Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, one of the many great saints of our Holy Church, as an instrument to bring souls to Christ in our times and to hold the Holy Catholic faith. But who is the one that holds that faith? Who is the one that turns the water into wine? Who is the one that makes souls return to God? Who is the one that makes the faith be strong inside of souls? It is the Blessed Virgin Mary standing by, speaking to her son, and saying, they have no wine. And giving the strength to the servants to do whatever he tells. That's all. Just donkeys. Only donkeys carrying Christ into Jerusalem. That is all the SSPX is. And all any order or any structure or any man who carries Christ. <coughs> just donkeys. There's nothing wrong with a donkey. They're sometimes stubborn, but there's nothing wrong with a donkey. Provided the donkey carries Christ in the direction that he wants to go. And all that matters, who is the one that gives the power for the donkey to do that? Who created the donkey? Who made the donkey able to walk? Who made him able to have a strong back? Only God. Remember when our Lord Jesus Christ was sitting on the back of that donkey, he was sustaining the donkey. He was carrying the donkey. So one reason why the Easterns point out is if you look carefully at an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary, of an icon in which she is holding Christ. If you look carefully, you will notice that it is not Mary who is holding Christ. He is holding her. He is taking her so that he is the one with the power. She is holding him in the arms and he is picking her up, so to speak. He is sustaining her. His divinity is always shown forth. And he is the one who created his own mother. He is the one that sustains her. He is the one that created the Holy Church. He is the one that created all of the saints. He is the one that created all the grace that exists inside of the Holy Church. And He gives the power, the power to all things, to be able to be made for His glory and return glory to Him. And so that we must open our eyes and see the miracles of Christ. The miracles are always there, but only the disciples see these first miracles. And somewhere along the line, the disciples forgot. Somewhere along the line, they began to think, the wine has come from me. Not from the one who told me to fill the water pot. Not from the one, the mother, who gave me the strength to be able to listen to him who told me to fill the water pot. No possibility of a miracle can happen without our Blessed Virgin Mary speaking to Christ first. She's the mediatrix of all grace. Unless she speaks to Christ first, we cannot say a Hail Mary. We cannot say the name of our Lord. We cannot say or do anything that is pleasing to God. She has to speak to Him first. They have no wine. They have no charity. They have no grace. They have no faith. They have no wine. And this wine must be poured inside of our souls. And it is done by a miraculous transition that happens somehow from carrying water pots from one place to another at the command of Christ. And only God knows how it happens. We don't know how electricity works, but we turn the light on anyway, and we read under a light bulb. And we don't know how the grace of God works, but we must turn on the light of the grace of God. We must accept that holy grace, and we must believe in it. And we see its examples every day. And so, Remember in our great crisis in the church, the great temptation for all of us, because God has given us the grace of the truth. He's given us the faith in an age in which no one has the faith. And the great temptation is, I've got the faith, and you don't. Why? Because I'm better than you. Because I'm smarter than you. Because I'm tougher than you. Because I'm holier than you. And all these things are a lie. God gives the grace to whomever He wills, whenever He wills, however he wills, and only he knows why. We must accept the graces that God has given us, but never become fools and think that they come from ourselves, and never forget from whence they came, and recognize that God who provides wine today, and provides manna today, and provides quail today, he can provide wine tomorrow, he can provide quail tomorrow, he can provide manna tomorrow, and he will for 40 years if necessary, in other words, until the end of time, until the end of our lives, all we must do is do whatever he tells us, 
Make sure the Blessed Virgin Mary is always standing by and see with our eyes the daily miracles of the workings of grace, which are miracles of Christ and not miracles of the foolish ones who call themselves disciples. And we'll close that and God bless you all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.